Okay, moving right along um, into the Great Tribulation here in Matthew chapter 24. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. i got to stop there. Again, this is verse by verse. So we're going to stop. If you want a, uh, just a casual read through, um, you can do that with Bible Gateway. You can select a voice and have a little robotic voice read to you. But, but no, we're going to kind of go through a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit superficially, but we're going to go verse by verse. So the abomination of, of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now, we understand that this at one time with Antiochus, they thought that that was it. Um, and it, it, it was a foreshadowing. That is the nature of Bible prophecy. Most of the time is there are gaps. There's a near and a far fulfillment. And this happens regularly. Again, I, I've pointed out before, and I, I do it all the time. Um, we have near and far fulfillments concerning Messiah and with a break in the middle. In the case of Christ, in the case of Messiah, we've got 2,000 years spread between right there with uh, the announcement of his birth Gabriel to Mary. He's uh, telling her about her son, and then um, he's Gabriel is giving her stuff that has to do with the first coming and, and the birth. But then Gabriel starts telling her about how he will sit on the throne of David. And we know that that does not happen until sometime yet in our future. doesn't happen until the second coming. Jesus himself, a little bit later, in the same book, Luke, did the same thing standing in the synagogue. And he's teaching from the Isaiah scroll, and he goes to Isaiah 61. The quote that Jesus gives covers only the first part of the prophecy. And he tells them, essentially, you know, this day this is fulfilled in your midst. And then he rolls up the scroll, and everybody's looking at each other like, what? What just happened? Why didn't he finish the passage? Well, because the rest of the passage has to do with his second coming. So there we have a prophetic break. It wasn't even the end of a sentence. It was like, a, you know, an implied kind of a comma. There was nothing. He didn't even finish the whole sentence. And we have a prophetic break of 2,000 years. So this happens. It happens regularly. So they thought Antiochus was it. Um, and he did do that to the temple, desecrated the temple. And it had to be cleansed and everything, all that stuff. It was, a, you know, just a mess. You know, much later. and But then we get here, <clears throat> a couple hundred years later, we have Jesus, and he's saying, so, when you see this prophecy by, spoken of by Daniel, um, wait, what? So when you see, and it hasn't happened yet. So that means it's still yet future. So you got more than 2,000 years. Jesus said this about 2,000 years ago, but the, Daniel's prophecy was several hundred years before that. So we got many years that, happen things that have to do with the end and that day in those days and in that at that time uh the day of the lord and at an hour this is going to happen and in that you know so the, the that kind of terminology is used to speak of a an era a time coming in the future that is very specific and um it's you know that day the day of the lord in those days this kind of a thing so uh, the hebraisms has to do with um same kind of thing that we mean when we look back and we say, you know, back in the day, I used to play basketball all the time. The day, so there was a day, a 24-hour day when you used to play basketball. No, no, no. You know, we, we say that all the time, right? Back in the day, back in the day, you, you couldn't get by with that, you know, that kind of a thing. We use that same kind of language. We just use it in a different way. But the Bible is using that language here. So try to think of those things when you're, when you're reading these things and then verify it cross-correlate with other passages. You can do keyword or phrase searches here at the top of Bible Gateway. Let me see if I can scroll this real quickly here, roll it up to the top, and you can see where you can input that stuff. Um, right up here. See, I'd, I had typed in Matthew 24. I had typed in Matthew 25, actually. and I was there a, a couple of videos ago. And, and then I... When I fast forward, when I clicked a little arrow, it, it changed my, my reference here. But you can do a search. You can do a keyword, key phrase search, what have you. And you can look some things up. So 
anyway, so he's telling the Jews, again, we were talking last time, a very good chance. Is he looking, t- speaking about church or is he talking about Israel? Okay, he's talking about Israel here, especially when you're talking about events that happened during the tribulation. We know he's talking about Israel because of the context about you're going to be hated um, by all the all the nations and so forth. And he's talking about um, all the Christs and so forth, false Christs that are coming. And they're going to uh, rise up to kill you. Again, you could still say, uh, well, they could be talking about church here because that could apply to church also. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached. Um, but then he starts saying, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Um, you could still say that uh, similar to like in the, the disciples era, that could still be talking about um, tribulation saints because we're in the tribulation here. In the context, he's still talking about tribulation. So um, you could still say that, not necessarily Jews, but tribulation saints. There could be some Gentiles. We have some Gentiles saved in the Old Testament, right? So clearly the people being spoken to, it isn't chiseled in stone that it has to be this group or it has to be that group. Talking about, I think when you see, when you see, when you see, it's anybody who's looking and who sees these things. When you see this event, then the next events are going to be these. So he's talking about a bunch of events, it looks like, and signs, not necessarily addressing people. Can we say that? He's showing signs that people are going to be around to look at, to recognize these signs. And I think that might be the best way to look at it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then verse 16. Then let those who are in Judea, oh, they very specifically speaking to a very particular people, right? Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who's in a field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath who are the ones who care about the Sabbath, whether or not it's, it's the Sabbath, right? So he's speaking to Jews, it's clear, in Judea, right? Um, for then there will be great tribulation. So now he's transitioned from, there'll be uh, all these events and things taking place, but he's talking about great tribulation here. Um, here he's talking about the delivery you up to tribulation. So here we've got tribulation, we've got trouble. Now we're transitioning from tribulation. We're talking about, now we're talking about great tribulation. And he's speaking specifically to Jews here. Now um, folks will say, well, this all happened in 70 AD. Again, with the foreshadowing type of things. Yeah. Uh, is he talking about um, 70 AD here in this entire passage or not? Um, let's take a look and find out. We know that he is back in Luke, in Luke's version, because he's in the synagogue, and the details get a little bit different, slightly different. So you can A and B those side by side and look at it and see some slight differences here. Some of this stuff did happen then. Does that mean it's never going to happen again? No, because it doesn't mean that, because we know with Antiochus Epiphanes and the abomination of um, um, desolation and so forth, we know that whole period is um, it happened, it was predicted, it happened, um, and uh, it's going to happen again, Jesus said. So we know that there's echoes that happen uh, in prophecy. So uh, is the whole chapter, is the question, is everything in this chapter all 70 AD type of things? Well, fair question. It's a good question. Let's find out. So... Um, then it says, and pray that your flight, verse 20, um, may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then, at that time, there will be great tribulation. Such as, ah, here we go. Here we have a time marker. Such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. So was that 70 AD? 
Well, we could say that that portion there is not 70 AD. Was 70 AD worse than either of the world wars? Clearly not. You did have over a million people, it's estimated, killed in this area. Speaking of Judea and what all happened when Israel, when Jerusalem was sacked in 70 AD, how many millions of people were, were killed, uh, in particular Jews, when you look at both world wars and you're looking at the world overall, especially. Um, so now we're talking about this future great tribulation for this future um, abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. Now we're going to link those two together and say, oh, we got a future abomination of desolation, but we also have a future great tribulation that's so bad there will up to that time have never been anything worse. And then after that time, this great tribulation that Jesus is talking about, there will never again be anything worse. Well, we can't even, we can't say that today. When we look at the book of, of Revelation, and unless you want to try to symbolize all that away, even if you want to try to symbolize all that away, you still have both war wars that were worse than 70 AD. So here we're talking about something that's still yet future because 70 AD was not it where we come into um, verse 21. And <clears throat> unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake or the chosen one's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now, some people go into all kinds of weird maths and stories and claims and things and, and go in and try to read this and bend this into that. And if you take this number here and you take this Strong's number here and you subtract that and stuff and it comes out. Again, we, I, we've, I've talked about this before. You can't take Strong's numbers, which are not inspired, um, and try to plug them into numbers in the Bible and add and subtract things and whatever and try to come up with different formulas and also try to come up with the days actually being shortened, no longer 23, point, 23 hours and 56 minutes or whatever. Now they're going to be 15-hour days. But the days that he's speaking of here are going to be shortened by the second coming because we are ramping up and things are getting worse and worse. You've, you've got the seal judgments. One-fourth of the earth is wiped out. That's 2 billion people, leaving 6 billion people left. Then you get into the trumpet judgments. One third of that is wiped out. One third of six billions, another two billion people wiped out. Now we're down to just by those uh, plagues of wrath alone, half the world, not counting natural death and other disasters and things that happen and uh, people killing each other and whatever else is going on. It's going to bring it down, you know, and whatever the Antichrist is going to be doing in the false church at that time, and other persecutions and martyrdom and so forth. That's outside of the wrath of God that comes from the seals and the trumpets and the woes, the woes. You got three woes also happening in that period. And then we, then we start talking about getting into the bowl judgments. What happens to the bowl judgments? If the seals were quarter of the earth wiped out and then the trumpets that follow are a third, everything happens in thirds, are the bowls halves? It's going to be, if we kept going in this calamity, and, and at the uptick of everything and the quakes bigger and, and, and some of the same types of plagues and wrath of God getting bigger and bigger and more consuming and the CME that pops off the sun and scorches the earth and scorches people. And now you no longer have not just islands shaking and mountains shaking. You've got all the islands sunk and you've got all the mountains flattened and you've, now you've got not just a fourth of the, the waters contaminated by blood and a third and, uh, you know, the seas. And then you got, you know, by the time you get into the bowls, you got all the water is turned into blood. You know, you go to drink your bottle of water and you, you know, and it's blood. When did this happen? You know, you, in the in the toilet, in the bathroom tap, in the kitchen tap, everywhere you go. Heck, if, there, if it could rain at that time, which I'm not even sure it will, probably the rain coming out of the sky would be blood. So I don't think it's speaking with what we're seeing as the events play out in the in the tribulation, I don't think we're looking at hyperbole where it comes to these quantities and these numbers. All the waters turn to blood. So, you know, so by the time you get to the end of this, if Jesus had not come back, um, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, the chosen one's sake, 
the believers who are still alive at the time, those days will be shortened. So they're shortened, they're cut short, all the, the wrath and the calamity is cut off by Christ's second coming, or otherwise no flesh would be saved. Plus, you've got Armageddon going on and all the armies. You know how we are with nukes and things, and all these countries with their finger on the button. Boom, it'd be over. That'd be it. Um, now, that you could call, it's Armageddon, it's apocalyptic. Well, yeah, that, I guess you could use it that way. But for the elect's sake, Jesus cuts all that off with his second coming. Um, then, if anyone says to you, speaking of that time again, of the Great Tribulation, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ or the Messiah, um, or there, don't believe it. Why? Because he's the Antichrist. He's the false Christ, right? Um, false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great sign, signs and wonders to d deceive. And we know this about Mystery Babylon and, and the, the false prophet, right? And, and all of his other sub-prophets, whatever, following him around to deceive the world, what they're going to be doing. To deceive, if possible, even the very elect or the chosen ones. The chosen ones at the times aren't going to be deceived, though. He's speaking hyperbolic because they know that this is fake, but they're going to be so convincing that it, it would, if possible, even deceive them. See, he says, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, in, in verse 26, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out. Look, he's in the inner rooms, secret secret rooms, having these meetings and stuff. Don't believe it. People with their cell phones go, look, look, I just followed this guy into the building here. It's the Messiah. No, it's probably the Antichrist. Don't believe it. Verse 27, 4, as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, boom, that quick, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now we're talking about the second coming again, just as we said, if possible, um, if not those days were short, um, no one would be saved. Second coming here again, um, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So that we're talking here about second coming, and it'll be that quick because we're talking about tribulation and then great tribulation, and now he's talking about second coming for wherever the carcass is the eagles will be gathered together. If you want to know the meaning of that, it seems like a random verse. Next time somebody says, what's your favorite Bible verse? Say, for wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will gather together and see what, what their faces look like. But that matches Revelation 19. Well, we're having the marriage supper of the land, and we have that lamb, and we have that great feast there. Revelation 19 records another great feast that's happening out in the wilderness before Christ starts or completes making all things new. And 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 the the carrion birds, or the eagles, the carrion birds are going to be feasting on the bodies of, of so many that were wiped out during Armageddon and at Christ's second coming and all of that. So um, that's going to be a different kind of a feast. That's going to be second coming type stuff in Revelation chapter, chapter 19. Now, I want to go. I'm trying to keep these short, though. So maybe I'll break it off here because this seems like another good place here. There's a, a place here to break it off and continue this. But let's remember where we are and we'll pick it up next time.